So with that, let's get to today's main event, NSP Peer, -peer Strategies. Designed for NSP grantees and their partners, this webinar features your peers, grantees sharing information about programs and different strategies they have used to overcome challenges, meet expenditure deadlines, and achieve NSP program goals. Featured teas are the Pasco County Community Development uh, Corporation in Florida, the Lake Worth Community Redevelopment Agency, also in Florida, the Utah Center for Affordable Housing, and the Cuyahoga County Land Revitalization Corporation in Cleveland, and last but not least, the City of Riverside, California. This webinar is for uh, all NSP teas, staff, and partners. At this point, um, let me introduce to you Stan Fitterman. Uh, Stan's put a lot of effort into assembling today's cast, and he's the Technical Assistance Director for the Florida Housing Coalition, and he's based in Tampa, Florida. And he'll introduce the others that you'll hear from today. Hi, Stan. Hey, thank you so much, uh, always, for moderating this. Um, here in front of you, you're seeing the... Uh, uh, purpose of the webinar, we're going to talk about using NSP as first mortgage financing, some marketing uh, ideas, uh, planning a statewide program, reinventing a market that's got a low demand for housing, and acquiring and rehab scattered site units for both ownership and for rental, which is always, always a challenge. And not advancing. There you go. Okay. All right. There I am. So there you see our cast for the day, the lineup, um, an impressive lineup, I might say, um, with, as Kent noted, there's everyone's name with their affiliation. And as always, from your NSP program, David Nogin and Hunter Kurtz. And now we get to the fun part. Um, our first speaker, Peggy Schott, comes to us from Pasco County, Florida, where she's a senior community development specialist. Pasco County, for those of you who don't know, is suburban Tampa. It boomed during the boom, and uh, let's just say it busted during the bust. Um, and Peggy is going to talk about their how their strategy for using NSP funds as a first mortgage for people purchasing NSP funded homes. So Peggy, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, <clears throat> Petco County got a lot of funding. Our total amount NSP one, NSP two, and NSP three is fifty three million plus as you can see. Um, some of the challenges is we went in and bought right away a lot of houses, more than 550 houses, and some of them are just, just weren't selling. Um, they may be small, they may be um, in neighborhoods that weren't wonderful. Um, this was an issue we had to deal with because we wanted to sell, of course, all the houses. And we had sold over 350 houses by now. Um, the other issue is people who fall through the cracks. Um, they are viable homeowners, but they can't quite qualify for commercial mortgages. So we thought we could put those two together. Um, so we use our NSP funds, which are already in the houses, because houses are bought by our nonprofit agencies um, to pay both the first mortgage and the second mortgage. Um, our, the first mortgage is a 30-year mortgage in most cases. Um, sometimes the mortgage is so small because we have some very inexpensive houses, the first mortgage, that they can afford to pay it off in 20 years based on ratio, and then we do it. Um, the interest rate we charge is a little bit high. Well, what we do is we allow commercial mortgages to charge the Fred Mac average 30-year rate plus 1%. That is the highest rate we allow from lenders. And we go up 0.75. And that way, we're not competing with commercial lenders. Um, so people aren't flocking to us as a way of being, getting a better deal. Um, we're eligible for these 0% interest. I mean, these loans can get that or will get that, a second mortgage at 0% interest. And that is the usual down payment assistance for all PASCO homebuyers. 
it may be deferred or for five years, or it may be a payback, depending on the ratio. Um, we, uh, we, our staff, underwrites the loans, but we have a third-party servicer. Uh, the payments, we escrow taxes and insurance in the payments, and this is the cost of our servicing. And we have used this servicer for years. All of Pasco County's loans must be paid back at some point. So we have a portfolio of over 1,000 loans that are being paid back at this time. <clears throat> okay, for applicant eligibility, it's pretty much NSP eligibility. Their income must be below 120% of median income. And, and the county rule is we don't allow net assets to be more than $250,000. Um, we find people want to take a job like this who don't need to. Um, we allow, we, we have our own credit um, applications. We don't allow repos or foreclosures within the last three years unless they can show us some really extreme reason why we should allow it. Um, more than $4,000 in unpaid non-medical charge-offs in the last three years. Um, bankruptcy, if, they're, if they went bankruptcy, it must be complete for a year, and it must have been caused by divorce, illness, death, or some catastrophic happening. And all these things, they need to be able to document to us. Um, if the cr credit is questionable, we do look at compensating factors such as why. Sometimes people just don't have a job long enough or something, and we allow that to go. Because we money back, we have delinquencies, but because we have a large portfolio of payback loans, we do have a staff member who collects. Um, our outside servicer with the bar for the first 60 days, and then our county staff member takes over and calls people and sends them letters. Um, <clears throat> if delinquency is due to a change in borrower circumstances, um, part payments can be accepted, not usually, but they can be, they, it can be modified. With first mortgage, um, we, we must require escrow be paid at all times, no matter what. Because otherwise, then they're behind the eight ball and they can't recover. There are, of, there are some financially unsophisticated borrowers who believe that they don't have to repay loans because we're county, we're government, we won't foreclose. Uh, and if we're doing this, we have to be able, we have teeth in it, otherwise it's useless. Um, we educate them. And explain what a mortgage is. Of course, they've had homebuyer classes, so they should know that. If they still refuse to pay, and we see that there there is nothing, they're ill, they're not unemployed, um, then we start our process of foreclosure. And it takes a long time. The way we have it, we could spend send letters, and we process serve them. And very often, when we process serve them, that scares them into start paying. Um, once we send it to the attorney, we stop talking to them, but we find that probably 60%, if not more, of our foreclosures become stipulation agreements, and then they they start paying once they realize we mean what we're saying. So we're really not out to get the house back. We don't want the houses. We want people to pay their loans back. Um, some pictures. Um, some of the houses we do, the one on the right is a condo, and we purchase some condos, and lend lenders don't lend on condos, so we're doing 100% on all of our condos. And this, uh, the one on the left, is a picture of the kitchen of one of our small houses in a not-so-wonderful neighborhood, but the inside of the house is beautiful, and the outside is all painted and pretty, too. Um, <clears throat> We've offered these loans for at least two and a half years. We've done 31 direct pay loans with NSP. We have a few others with our ship. Um, as I said, we have more than 1,000 loans in our portfolio, and because we have such a large 
NSP program. It's growing every month. Uh, we're trying to help people become homeowners, even if they have some minor credit pro problems, if they see that they are good prospects for homeownership. Um, we sold some homes that we were really not able to sell before, but people who can't quite get the credit to buy through a commercial lender is, are very happy to come to us and, and buy houses. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I think what one of up. the things that's, that's interesting to me about uh, uh, your program design and is, is so many folks that I'm familiar with around the country are doing direct pay loans, are using Habitat, for instance, to process 0% interest loans. I think it's interesting that y'all decided to offer a first mortgage product with an interest rate tied to an index as opposed to kind of going with a straight 0% interest loan. Why? What made you decide to do a, do this interest rate? We don't. We're not in competition with the the regular lenders, and we're also not trying to get hundreds of people to fork to our, our loans. We want we, we want to get the people who need the loans. Kind of and a the last we, resort. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's really what we are. And Kent, do we have a, a question? We, we do. We've got a question from Bob. And uh, Bob, let me go ahead and unmute there. Hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, uh, in servicing loans, it takes sometimes quite a bit of time and effort. Uh, does the income, the interest income, generate enough income to pay those salaries for servicing costs, attorney's fees for foreclosures, et cetera? So, I think so. We have had somebody on staff um, doing collections way before we were in this piece. So that's not additional. And we get a lot of money back. You know, a lot of people, a lot of, of cities and cities have a history of forgiving loans, and we never have. So our program is way more way bigger than it would have been because we're asking for paybacks. And you said there's a third-party servicer that services the loans. Is that a bank? No, it's a servicer in Tallahassee that advises um, in these kinds of loans in in government profits. Oh, okay. Um, and then the long term, once the grants close that out, uh, this the, the the income should generate enough to pay the admin costs for all the thing of the loans in too. For your mortgages, theoretically, they could be out there for a long time. Yes, longer than I will be. Gotcha. Thanks, question, Bob. And uh, seeing no more hands up or no more questions in the Q and A, let's uh, move on to Joan Oliver. Hi, Joan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, and Joan, Joan is the uh, executive director of the Lake Worth Community Redevelopment Agency in Lake Worth, Florida. That's right. Uh, Lake Worth is a very small city, We're actually less than seven square miles. And our target area is actually only about a fourth of that area. Um, we are an SP2 grantees. We're a consortium. We have 20 partners, including nonprofit and profit um, agencies, and we do. So we have uh, the capacity to pull off such a large grant in such a small, such a small amount of time. Our total funding that we applied for was $23 million, and we are doing all five eligible activities: financing mechanism, acquisition, rehab, land banking, demolition, and redevelopment. And just to give you a little bit about um, community redevelopment agencies, we're actually a special district uh, created in Florida. Our sole purpose is to do redevelopment and economic development in our small area. And at the time of the grant, um, our agency only had three people working for it, and now we have five. Main development partners are Adopt a Family and Habitat for Humanity. Adopt a Family took on the development of about 40 units, Habitat uh, 36 units. 
and CRA itself is picking up the remainder of those units. Of course, it still has an incredibly old housing stock. Uh, ours has declined almost 50% in the last three years, and already uh, more than about half of the units here in the city are rentals. Obviously, at an extremely high rate of foreclosures in the area. So our challenges, uh, we have, for the most part, 25-foot wide lots. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure, um, everything from streets to sidewalks to lighting. Uh, we actually have unpaved streets here. We have numerous boarded up buildings, both houses and com housing and commercial uh, properties. We have an alleyway system that runs all the way through the city, which is good for transportation, but unfortunately there are, a lot of them are overgrown and there's a lot of grown in those areas. Uh, we hang, have a high uh, gang activity in the area. And for some reason, our little small city here missed uh, the redevelopment boom for the most part. Here's some pictures just to show you some of the challenges. You can see in the upper left-hand side, very narrow lots. For the most part, we have what are called shotgun homes, um, zero lot line, no sidewalks, no line in the area. We have PC rail corridor that runs right through the middle of our uh, residential area. We have a lot of trash um, all in public areas. You can see the under overgrown alleys, um, a lot of people dump their trash back there as well. What could we do to make ourselves uh, stand out in comparison to other places? Well, we felt some things go on in the last few years. You know, through our redevelopment efforts, we were able to attract the brand new supermarket. We were able to attract the home to the county's largest cultural organization and, and done a few parks. We focused on, uh, you know, what those what those um, you know, positive things have done for the city, and then also focused on what the city specifically has to offer. You can actually walk to the beach. It's about a mile. Um, an incredibly walkable city. You can walk to City Hall. You can walk to the downtown area. Like I said, you can walk to the beach. Obviously, extremely nice weather. And abundant interest in and support for the arts here. We have a lot of artists. We have a lot of galleries. And we have a lot of nonprofits. So marketing materials really wanted to highlight you know, those, those things in a really positive way. So we used flowers. We used things that, you know, we really didn't think would, um, you know, look to the kind of government. And we appeared to, we appealed to what we thought was a really wide audience, focus on, on things that we thought um, might be important to people, um, like living sustainably, living in a smaller home, um, living in a green home. All of our new construction is Florida Green Building certified. Um, being close to services and needs, so there's no need for, for transportation. Developed a logo pretty early on. It's the house with the puzzle piece in it and came up with the tagline, Living Reinvented. And we put this on everything that we did. Uh, we did a ton of marketing, um, as close as we possibly could, but it was a lot. We did leaflets in all of residents' uh, utility bills. We did direct mail postcards not only to the people living here, but the people in the surrounding zip codes and specifically to rental communities. We also did posters on Trail, which is the community rail system from Miami to Palm Beach. We actually had a lot of um, calls from that poster. We also uh, did a kiosk in a local mall with some animation. We handed out things at um, all city and kinds of uh, events taking place in the city, for instance, the street painting festival, Pride Day, uh, for night events. We have fenced wrappings on all homes, on our tagline and our logo, on our phone number, and our website. Uh, so, did the brand new website, did Twitter, Facebook, Craigslist, everything you could think of. Also, had program and contact information signs on all of the NSP2 homes. So when you drove through the community, you can see these really large signs that gave you all the basic information on the program itself. We honors on the city light poles and the gateways um, leading away from the interstate into the city. And we did tons of flyers um, and distributed to our 20 partners and that they gave out um, so to the um, neighborhood officials the stakeholders, elected officials, and we have these in Spanish, English, and Creole, so to a wide audience of people. Um, my baby project is <laughs> the 12 urban lofts that are currently under construction. They've worked um, units 
close to the downtown, and they're marketed specifically to artists who are living or wishing to relocate to um, Lake Worth. We marketed these specifically to um, South Florida cultural organizations. We did some advertising in cultural magazines. Um, we also even did some advertising in magazines up north, like New York. The scale of the loft, you can see um, in the instance on the left-hand side, there's the shuffleboard courts, and there's the railroad. Just on the other side of the railroad is City Hall, and there's the downtown area. There are three lofts consisting of four buildings with three separate architectural styles. It's on 1.2 acres of redevelopment land. There's a total of 12 units, and each unit is up to approximately 600 square feet. And a for-profit builder, one of our consortium partners to construct it, and we're using Housing Partnership, one of our other uh, partner organizations for income qualification. We have a very tight timeline, obviously. We're trying to get done before the February deadline. This stuff has taken probably about a month ago. Um, we reached out to lots of local arts organizations uh, to help fill up the project, and out of the 12, we have about eight that are spoken for at this time. Overall, uh, our goal was obviously 100 units. We have, at this time, 97 properties. 52 of those have been completed. We have 73 home ownership units and seven which are sold or are currently under contract. We have 24 rental units, and the majority of those 20 are leased. Uh, we still are under construction, and we probably have about five to eight properties that are in the pipeline that are waiting to close. We will definitely make our 100 um, goal. Here are after, after pictures. The picture on the left was actually an illegally split dwelling uh, that had been split into four um, efficiency units that we were able to demolish. And the family, our partner, was able to build a duplex on the right-hand side. Um, the average rents for these are about $800 a month. Townhome, uh, there was a, a large townhome project built just north of the downtown area, and about half of them went into foreclosure. Originally, they went for close to $400,000, offering them for about $100,000 to $120,000. There was a lot of work needed in them. Um, as you can write, they're really, really nice units, but we did convert everything to gas to try to bring down the cost of these the utilities. And these obviously went very quickly, very popular units. About all I have. Thank you. Right, Joan, I have a question. Um, sometimes in our world, we get a little worried about the NIMBYs coming out whenever we really do uh, strong marketing efforts. Did you have any mm -hmm. resistance to? Uh, uh, to what you're doing, any efforts, any uh, anybody came, coming out in opposition or any political opposition? Absolutely. I did have a lot. The the good thing was we were promoting home ownership for the most part. And the majority of these units that you know were originally in the western area before NSP were rentals and were not very well taken care of. And we had, um, I think, close to about $6 million worth of code fines that had been, you know, going year after year after year. So changing those, getting rid of those, and up, you know, really nice units um, that had a family moving into them really helped. Obviously, you know, getting some of that stuff off the books and paid for was extremely important back on the tax roll. And a lot, we made an event out of everything that we did. So, you know, some of the local shows or some people who didn't really understand um, you know, building affordable housing, we would invite them out to these events to meet the family, to see the difference in the community, and it definitely had an impact. We've got a question here from Sharon. So I'm going to unmute Sharon. Hi there. How are you? Sharon? There? Hi. Ask you, uh, go ahead and ask your question. So we're wondering um, how much was the cost of your marketing strategy, and did you use general admin for it? Yeah, I used uh, money from uh, the administration budget. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how much we paid. I know that it's probably between twenty and forty thousand dollars, and I know that we have money left over. So things that we did really didn't require us to spend any money. Uh, you know, like I said, we went on Craigslist, we went on Facebook, we did a lot of public meetings with different organizations, the neighborhood associations. We got them involved early on. 
We also targeted a lot of different um, where we thought there might be people who would need um, homes, especially close to work, like the hospitals, the school board, the sheriff's office, the fire department, et cetera. And we did, we kind of took our, our show on the road and would do breakfast um, at different organizations in the morning and give a bit of background about the city and about the program. Um, part, I think with the exception of probably about five units, all of our units are spoken for. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Hunter uh, with the, the HUD headquarters. I just want to point out that um, you, a lot of times you can charge your marketing towards, uh, you know, development costs because it is sort of mm -hmm. tie it, just tying it to the home and rather right. sort of general. You can, you have to be admin. No, but we wanted to put as much money as we could in actual units and we are doing really well on admin, so we were charge it to admin. But I understand what you're saying. You can charge it to project delivery. Uh, thank you, Joan. I see no more questions. So at this point, let's move on to uh, Mike Plazier. And Mike is the Executive Director of the Utah Center for Affordable Housing in Salt Lake City. Hi, Mike. Thank you, Stan. Uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity to share a little bit about our program. Uh, Utah Center for Affordable Housing came about as a uh, idea from the Utah Bankers Association and the Utah League of Credit Unions in uh, 2008 that there was a need for uh, help in the market to help the foreclosure problem. And as the foreclosure problem was increasing in Utah, they had to find a way, uh, different avenues to solve that problem. Uh, so they're a board that includes uh, not only the Banker Association, the League of Credit Unions, has some an authority, and and our Utah Housing Finance Agency, and different entities to to come up with ideas to how we could solve that. Uh, the, the new nonprofit was actually formed in 2009, and uh, worked with the state. The state did an RFP for the and as he funds, uh, the Utah Center for Affordable Housing was the uh, sole entity to receive those funds. And the idea was uh, to help stabilize the market and use to turn those foreclosed properties around the state into affordable housing. Our target market included uh, the watch front, which is the main metropolitan area that has the majority of the state population, but also a county in the southern part of Utah. So we had five counties out of the 23, included the majority of the population for the state. Under our model, we worked not only with the NCST, which was is a, and continues to be a great source for foreclosed homes, but we were also with the bank relationship and the relationship with the credit unions, we were able to uh, go out and find other properties that didn't make it through the NCST that were serviced either locally or a lot of them, uh, several of the projects came out of, uh, were in construction and were able to uh, buy them as partially completed projects and, and able to access those. Uh, using that, we were able to access uh, a, a lot of different properties, different types of properties. Uh, one of the unique features also was that uh, the state, uh, in their program, wanted us to or required us to use uh, share of the money for land banking, and this was due to the uh, foreclosure problem in Utah not being as as widespread in as many areas. And the state saw a great opportunity to go out and, and purchase a land or different uh, land banking opportunities to hold this hold that until the market improved and turned around and and the, the land could be put into affordable housing. Uh, prior to, uh, Utah Center for Affordable Housing, if a entity, a nonprofit, or a housing authority. Uh, to acquire a property, they had to uh, 
you know, different banks or different sources, credit unions, and find out who who had the foreclosure, who they had to deal with. Each uh, it was different in their structure, and we uh, had the uh, Salt Lake City and uh, one of the city councilmen, and they said they they had found a house in their target area that had been the the couple that owned it. Both of the borrowers had passed away. The family, it was on a reverse mortgage. The family was not interested in buying the home. The city knew who the lender was, and they were off for a full price on it, and it took them uh, nine months to buy it. We contacts uh, with not only the NCST, but with the local banks uh, and lenders. We were able to set up a standardized process where these nonprofits could buy these. So CH... Uh, on the right side, you can see after UCH, we act as a clearinghouse. We not only provide a source to find those uh, foreclosed properties for the nonprofit entities across the state, but we also act as a source uh, using the NSP funds and uh, funds from, from uh, lenders for these nonprofits to buy the homes. Uh, the Utah Center for Affordable Housing actually only owns uh, one home right now, and that home. Uh, we use it to uh, actually house homeless families. We give it to the local home shelter, which they're able to uh, rent those to. They use vouchers and rent that to a homeless family. And then that home right now has a, a single mother with eight children living in it. And, and her goal, she's a great, great renter. I wish we had uh, more like her. Her goal is... Uh, to be able to buy that home someday, and we're working with the, the Road Home, which is a local homeless shelter, to find ways that we can help her buy that. But uh, what we did to provide access to equity for the nonprofits is the nonprofit entity identified a home after we sent them a list of homes. If they identified a home that they wanted to purchase, we'd fund the price of that home up to 100% of the purchase and rehab cost on that home, and the uh, that at a zero percent interest. Uh, after they rehab home and found a lower moderate income family to to home, then we would uh, they would pay us off, and we'd do that again. Many times we were able to use their sources of, of capital that they had to uh, augment the number of homes we could buy and. And they'd use sometimes they had RDA funds or their own funds, their own cash that they could use to buy those homes, and we would help supplement those. We found that many of the nonprofits, besides not having a uh, as to the foreclosed properties in their neighborhoods, they uh, really didn't have the capital and the the source funds to do that. So us providing the source of funds became a, a tremendous benefit for them. Uh, the total funding in NSP was you uh, received the minimum 19.6. And as I mentioned, UCH was the was the sole, uh, sole recipient of that money. Um, we looked at different ways we could help our nonprofit partners you know, with nine homes, and in, in some occasions we've actually partnered with them where they didn't have the uh, resources, either capital or sometimes uh, technical uh, staff and ability. We would partner with them on different housing projects. Uh, one of the uh, unique challenges that we had here was that this was an entity uh, really instigated uh, or started by financial institutions uh, to solve the problem. And it was looked on um, what uh, everybody wondered what the real intent of the financial industry was in, in doing this. And so at first, it was a little bit difficult to go out and establish those partnerships. Uh, there was some opposition from some of the nonprofits and the different uh, affordable housing providers that we had to go out and overcome. Um, that rather quickly once they saw the, the benefit that we provided to them. And one of the unique features we have here in Utah is 
because of their Utah's favorable banking laws, I think I believe state and population were number 38 in population, but were uh, Utah's actually number eight in the amount of debits we have here from banks. We have a, a lot of uh, industrial loan banks that are headquartered in Utah, and they'll have the same CRA requirements uh, as the as the local banks. So there's a there's a, a tremendous need for these institutions, financial institutions, to uh, put C money back into the community, and we be able to help them find, uh, the financial institutions to find ways to do that also. Uh, a youth foreclosure problem is very was limited a lot to the larger, higher homes and new construction, uh, where we had a tremendous building growth, and where that path of growth was was a foreclosure problem. Was one of the issues was that the uh, homes were typically not in the price range that would have been considered affordable. So there was a uh, we didn't have large divisions or tracts of land that that could be used for affordable housing, and most cars were scattered scattered sites, and uh, you typically wouldn't find uh, more than one foreclosed home on any block. Uh, our as I mentioned, nonprofit developers really were having a hard time. Uh, a lot of times the investors, because there wasn't a, a large foreclosure problem, investors saw foreclosed homes as a, a great opportunity to buy a home, a uh, general fix-up or rehab on it, and buy it at a great discount, and then be able to sell that property. Uh, the issue we had uh, was the uh, we have a, a non-profit. Uh, there were some areas of the our target that didn't have active nonprofits or nonprofits that really were active in those areas. So we worked with um, some of the local ones and uh, actually helped them with the use of our capital and access to those properties, help them to be able to expand their target market areas to include more of more of the target market areas. And uh, one of our challenges I think that that all of us have is with with this being with the deadlines that were on this, there were there were pressures to uh, initially go out and spend this money, and uh, I think we were able to do that wisely. It did cause us some uh, head and lost sleep some nights, and also it, with the NSP new and being a new program, and uh, with it uh, being formulated really by financial institutions that didn't have a lot of experience in the HUD regulations, it was it was a Ongoing challenge to stay uh, abreast of the the NFP regulations and their uh, verifications of those regulations. Uh, just to our pack today, we've been able to provide uh, 523 affordable housing units. This project you see there is a new one that's actually uh, it's. Uh, this is a rendering of a project that's going to be built on some land that we did with the land banking. Uh, it's going to be 180 units of uh, for housing, all of them under 60% AMI. And this project, really, it's uh, going to be a unique project in Utah in that it's going to be very family-oriented. It'll be a bedroom, three-bedroom, and a significant amount of four-bedroom units. And the uh, four units, uh, as far as we know, they're the only four-bedroom, three-bath rental units that they have in the state of Utah. This project also is uh, going to be geothermal and photovoltaic, so that the utility bills, we believe the utility bills will be reduced by about 75% of a normal, a normal unit. And this is being built by one by Housing Plus, which is one of our nonprofit partners, and uh, they hope to break ground on this early next summer. And uh, there's some photos. This is uh, some before photos of a couple of homes that uh, were purchased in Utah. And 
the uh, after pictures uh, to show the uh, what they look like a after. And again, all of these were purchased rehab by our nonprofit partners. This is a picture of a, a project that we bought uh, from a local bank. Uh, it's a it was a 60 unit. Uh, project in uh, in Pro Utah that uh, it was only about 18 months old when we bought it, but uh, there was significant action defects, and actually the two units of the 60 units were uninhabitable, and the, had an occupancy at about 50 percent, although it was a brand new project. Uh, we were able to go in and fix. Or through one of our housing or nonprofit partners, they were able to go in and repair the construction defects, and it actually turned it into an apartment project with the 60 units, and it's uh, remained almost fully rented since the time it's it's been renovated. Uh, shows the after pictures of what that project looks like now, and. Appreciate your time and uh, appreciate uh, the uh, opportunity to present this. My um, often in our world, when we talk about coordinating a lot of different organizations, that much overused term of cat seems to come up. What think was one or two things that was important for you to help keep up and keep people on track? Uh, number one is to have a Everybody understand the mission and what we're trying to accomplish and set clear expectations of what's going to happen. If they understand where we're trying to go and, and then and end of it, this was, you know, it's a new program. We had uh, a lot of unknowns when we first started doing this and a lot of twists and turns in it. And we had very a good good partnerships. I think this their partnership with the state, who was the grantee. Uh, as we ran to different issues, they were uh, excellent at helping us resolve those. The, the nonprofit partners were. Uh, we all understood where we were going, where we needed to get to, and then we all worked together to try to find a solution on how to get there. Yeah, so having similar expectations is probably yes extremely important from the beginning. And a question here from Jose. Hi, Jose. I've unmuted you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. So I wanted to know um, less inventory using the trust. I want that's a ongoing concern that about other people have have um, experienced or with any other strategies to obtaining REOs. Our experience here is that we have seen a, a decrease in the all in the uh, GST foreclosures um, and from the local banks. Uh, one option we're looking into is looking on uh, on the LS and uh, finding homes out there that maybe don't come through the NCST. And I think we've a great resource. NCST is a great resource. But uh, some of the local banks have been a, a, an excellent resource on also providing additional properties, especially if you're not looking at the uh, traditional single-family residence. If you look at land or uh, uh, fourplexes or units larger than fourplexes, or uh, it's an excellent way to go look at work with the local financial institutions, uh, credit unions, and banks to find those properties. And another question that's probably not to the subject, but on um, as we close out our grants, is that going to require us to um, abide by our target areas still? Jose, let's uh, um, have you ask that question again at the end when uh, we've got the uh, NSP reps with us. So okay, please Great. hold that one and uh, okay. raise your hand again uh, at the end. So. Great, thank you. Good, thanks. I um, want to take, since we've got three, three down and two to go, I just want to take a minute 
the panelists wanted to jump in with any questions for any of the folks that have gone before them or after them. And I'll so, I think uh, Kent is going to unmute. So if any of you all have any questions on the marketing, or if anything, I guess if anything, want to add anything about um, your marketing efforts or if you're considering doing any uh, first mortgage financing. That could be a <laughs> uh, no, well, in well this is this is Bill this is Bill Whitney. Can you hear me? We can we can. Uh this doesn't really address marketing or uh other topics, but it certainly addresses uh, Jose's last question. Um, in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, which I will be explaining in a little bit, we do not have a shortage of foreclosed houses to purchase. <laughs> we continue to have an overabundance that are extremely difficult uh, to make the numbers work on and to sell, you know, oversupply, lack of maintenance. Uh, that continues to be our problem even after uh, three, four, five years of MSP. Does get might be a kind of a market specific? Certain markets are we're seeing starting to come back a little bit, and others not quite yet. So yeah, I would say. Well, at, at this point, let me. Uh, you, you're hearing his voice now, but let me introduce uh, Bill Whitney. He's the chief operating officer for the Cuyahoga County Land uh, Realization. Corporation, also known as the Cuyahoga Land Bank, and uh, um, hi, Bill, and you can go ahead and advance your slides. Thank you, Ken. Um, you let me start with. Uh, we're going to talk about the Cleveland Cuyahoga SP2 program, and really kind of a unique consortium that runs that program. The consortium members are the City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, and the Cuyahoga County Land Reutilization Corporation, or the CDLRC, or can't explain the Cuyahoga Land Bank. Um, we're a bit different, so let me start with just the structure of the CCLRC. Uh, we're a quasi-governmental nonprofit corporation created in the summer of 2009. Unlike Utah, we didn't really have a problem of building up trust. We weren't created by financial institutions or anything like that. But we were created because of the huge need to do something about the foreclosure crisis, not just in the city of Cleveland, but also in the older uh, entering suburbs. So we had a ton of support. Support. We did statewide legislation. We needed a series of uh, county government actions, and we had all kinds of friends and advocates. But sometimes that can be just as challenging as trying to uh, win people's trust. We're like a new kid in town, like the only game in town in the middle of a huge crisis. Expectations were huge, I think, over the last three and a half years. No, we haven't made everybody happy, but I think uh, we're doing a really good job. Core funding comes from $7 million that we annually receive. That's derived from the penalties and interests that are collected on delinquent uh, property taxes. Um, we're a private enterprise with a lot of transactional capabilities and powers. We can buy, we can sell, we can lend, we can borrow, we've sold bonds. Um, Definitely, we do not have eminent domain parts, and I think that's probably good. Some of the unique aspects of uh, our consortium. Uh, we were actually asked to be the lead member before we even existed. Uh, when the NSP2 NOFA was released, a couple of us were working as consultants, laying the groundwork that needed to be done to even get our doors open. Owners came to us and asked us to be the consortium's lead member. They thought that would be sexy countywide, a lot of the things that HUD was implying through the um, NOFA, and asked us to begin working on the application. Now, we were really naive. We would be flattered at that, but it was more like if people remember the old TV commercial 
kids are sitting around the dinner table and mom's out dinner that looks like something they've never seen before, kind of the old gobbledygook, and they kind of all look at each other. And then the old one looks at the youngest one and says, I know, we'll get Mikey to try it. So kind of like uh, our introduction to putting together the whole application. It was really David and three bias and you know, people joke about the 1,000-pound gorilla in the room. Well, our meetings, we had 3,000-pound gorillas and uh, an organ grinder monkey, which would be us. Without a lot of history and trust and mutual respect, the consortium would have never even lasted through the application stage. And I know there's all kinds. One of the most interesting things about NSP2 to me is the different types of consortiums that exist throughout the country. Um, and the, the application process with our consortium may have been one of the biggest challenges that we get to go through. Uh, any delicate decisions, target area selections, who does what, what gets what, limited, limited administrative funding. Uh, the CCLRC was kind of lucky. Our three uh, gorilla partners, they, they were all rich. They had increasing revenues from CDBG and increasing public housing revenues, increasing revenues from income taxes, increasing revenues from property taxes. So they insisted that we get all the SP2 admin money. That little joke there. Okay, uh, CCLRC challenges to overcome. Visual demolition cap. Uh, as I mentioned, we just uh, had a huge uh, need for demolition. We still do. Um, and we knew we could ask for a waiver, but knowing the competitive nature of the program, we did feel comfortable asking for a very large waiver. We had $41 million. We could have easily used it all for demolition. Uh, we ended up looking for 15% uh, cap. Uh, recently, we had that slightly increased. Um, Cleveland and the CCLRC um, took demos. Um, both um, of our operated programs, or the CLRC was just just beginning to, most of it was on properties we owned. Cleveland was on nuisance abatement demos. But there was a lot of things we needed to do with limited demo funds. So we both needed to change our business as usual models from our normal uh, demo procedures. We know that that's easier said than done. But we worked through it uh, closely, and I think we really maximized uh, the dollars we had available. The housing market, and this, of course, was the biggest challenge. Um, with no caps and just restrictions, we were awarded $41 million. And up with over $30 million programmed for housing, we a new construction. It was a huge challenge. Um, at the time of the application, people recall that uh, some people, including Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, had some uh, recent NSP1 experience under their belts, and the CLRC was busy putting together a very good and experienced staff. But even then, summer of uh, 2009, must really recognize the extent of our weak market and the lack of uh, bankable buyers uh, due to the crisis. Um, where came this? Uh, the couple of uh, items that are summarized below. Um, Cleveland the County both uh, tweaked their single-family re-NSP1 programs, and I'm not going to go into the various uh, nuances, but we can certainly get you that information. But again, it was a constant uh, learn there. Were created, and people did look to, us to play uh, an important role. Um, in addition to the program design issues, uh, our local NSP1 programs were really hampered by the fact that developers had a hard time finding and acquiring suitable stock. As I said earlier, we had zillions of houses, but suitable stock that even worked with the amount of NSP uh, subsidy dollars available. 
And I think it's probably universal across the country. We all know our readers, whether they're for or nonprofit, uh, hate compliance rules and regs. Well, when bank got established, we actively set up acquisition pipelines um, to acquire and hold for closed properties. Many of these were low-valued properties that we got from Fannie Mae or HUD or through tax foreclosure. And we'd also do the compliance on these and kind of tee them up nice and pretty um, for our nonprofit or um, private rehabbers that uh, we were trying to intend to the Cleveland or the counties and a P2 housing rehab programs. I'll mention here, also, unlike Utah or even the earlier case in Pasco County, we did not we recognize that the market was rough enough that we weren't going to run out and acquire a whole bunch of uh, stock with NSP2 acquisition money to the bank and hope that something would happen in the future. Um, the vast majority of the properties we took early on through our pipelines were low-value properties that we really needed to just stop the flipping and get off the market. That's what all of our uh, constituents wanted, our local governments. Um, had just been continually flipped, selling for 1000 selling for $1,000, and it was a vicious cycle. And again, a huge oversupply of housing, so a lot of properties were acquired uh, primarily just for demolition. But we do want to be able to tee up what we could within um, and two target areas, really with this whole person getting them plugged into the rehab programs to make them work. We did not want to have any inventory left that had any kind of NSP2 strings on that we had to worry about 10-year reuse or had to go out and uh, with our own funds because we acquired with NSP2 but didn't have any um, loan dollars left. Uh, we've got a few of those that we're dealing with. Unfortunately, we do have our NSP2 resources that we can address those issues. But again, it was unlike some of the other um, examples you heard earlier of people uh, really just uh, you know, land banking and mothballing, waiting for the market to go up. We we didn't do that. Uh, even with the changes, we also had a very early recognition that uh, we really needed to do more multifamily projects. Um, we had more dollars that we really had to switch around early on and put into some of these larger projects. Um, the logics, of course, involved many more layers of financing and other complexities. Some of these didn't actually close financing until late 2011. You can imagine we had many followers, like senators and congresspeople and mayors, who were all extremely concerned that we weren't, weren't going to hit our February 11, 2012 percent expenditure target. We were at about 10% in August of 2011. We had some depuration plans uh, set up. I'm to say all of the larger multifamily projects did proceed as planned, and we actually hit the 60% expenditure level by uh, the February deadline. Another challenge I'll just briefly touch upon was uh, the unfortunate change in the uh, definitions between NSP 1 and 2 for public facilities. Again, even before NSP and uh, to the government of Cleveland and um, the county government as well had been investing in demolitions. We'd had an oversupply of rundown housing for a while and have an awful lot of vacant land. So um, using P1 and a lot of other studies that had been done to come up with alternative uses of uh, vacant land, uh, many of which I'm sure uh, on the call here are familiar with. Um, the city of Cleveland had developed a very robust, very popular NSP1 uh, reimagining program, reuse of vacant lots, with a change of uh, ability to uh, 
tax P2 funds for what were defined as public facilities. Um, their work that had to be put in primarily by the city of Cleveland, working with HUD, a lot of good support from HUD, but it took a long time. And, you know, I'll call it a phased down reimagining program, but it, it did turn out to be about a $1 million um, inver, which was very worthwhile. Um, with that, I'll just show a few pictures of the um, some of the family projects that were done. Uh, Circle East Townhomes is actually 20 units of new construction, uh, middle income or 120% limit. Some of the first new constructed uh, units in the city of East Cleveland, which is an inner ring suburb that uh, has had some tough times, but it does border on University Circle Inc., which is... Uh, the home of a lot of important institutions, uh, Case Western University uh, Hospital, the age of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so, and uh, these are rental units, and they stop almost immediately. Uh, the apartments is uh, our, uh, near West Side Target areas. It's a historic structure. It was 50% of median. And just some small little tidbits like uh, St. Luke's Manor. This was an old closed hospital, three different phases. Massive. All our money went um, with uh, tax credit. Um, and since the syndicators, which I'm not surprised syndicated or not, but basically uh, the syndication was rolled at net 60% of median. Um, and for it didn't count as part of a 50% set aside, but we had um, other projects, so that that 50% uh, set aside wasn't an issue for us. With that, I'm going to send it. All right, I have a question for you. You indicated um, that you could have used all 31 million for demo. Um, then what would have what 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 the land what would how maintained it, managed it, or what, what, what happened after that? We probably have about 10 years to figure that out. As I said, okay. we have a very active reimagining vacant land RESA program that deals with uh, a lot of the traditional side lots and uh, community gardens. We have some rather innovative, far out stuff like a, a new winery that. Uh, has gone into the middle of the city, mm. and there's also a huge garden with huge greenhouses, a fish farm selling fish, large composts, bringing in some money. Well, but I wouldn't like to think that the real future of uh, Cleveland is to go back to agriculture over the next 50 years. Mm. We're working with the sewer district. You know, they have environmental issues with uh, stormwater runoff, so we're uh, trying to set aside some tracts of land that uh, they can meet some EPA uh, mandates with, and they have some funds that uh, can help with that. Um, the city's not going to have a million people like they did uh, back in 1950. Um, when I say 41 million, um, the need for demolition in the county, I think, is still clocked at about 125 million. We were fortunate in that the Attorney General of the state of Ohio, through the national settlement with the major five major lenders, remarked 75 million for, um, demolitions through county land banks. It had to be matched. So after we spent our NSP2 money, we're now working on uh, 23 million, which is a combination of 12 million from the Attorney General, five million and other. Uh, tax penalty and interest money um, through the county prosecutor and our normal demolition budget of about $4 million a year. So great. I'm not saying that that's all we should be doing here. I'm uh, very satisfied and excited about the housing projects that were funded. Um, it's just still a tough market, and while I think it's gradually getting better, um, we'd be foolish to think that uh, we're out of the woods. And are lenders willing to on some of the uh, home ownership stuff you're doing? You have lenders that are willing to participate and 
minute mortgages? A little better than it was a year ago. It's so rough. And of course, we have our CDFIs, we have our consortiums of lenders that, that have always had access to certain subsidized money and things of that nature. We have very active NHS, um, but certainly not like it was uh, before the crisis. Uh, Cleveland had a lot of good housing stuff going on in the 90s. We had a lot of participation from our major lenders. The major lenders all had uh, set up community uh, CDCs, and we have a very great CDC network across uh, this. We have very sophisticated um, ring suburbs um, with a lot of housing people. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff going on, but um, extra lending is just really gradually starting to come back. Do you ever consider doing like what uh, Peggy's doing and doing first mortgages, self-finance first mortgages? Not sure. We we ran out of NSP two, or the city and the county ran out of NSP two uh, single family loan money, and we have some NSP two funding for acquisitions. We used our corporate money to rehab them, and as we went to NHS. We funded them, but with NHS, which is a HUD certified lender. Um, the actual mortgaging and the servicing for us. I'm talking two or three cases, not like a thousand. Uh, we may get into that business sometime again. There are other entities that do that. And right now, we're just still awful busy with uh, demolition. And actually, we have some other non-NSP2 funded rehab programs that have become successful. We have about we've helped private sector nonprofit and for profit rehab about 500 homes. Um, they are not what were Cadillac, NSP, Enterprise Green Standards. They are not at that level, um, but they meet code. They're a good, safe, and sanitary product, and we're very proud of the fact we've got about 500 of them done, and about 50 percent have been owner occupied. All right. All right. Uh, no, I see no questions, but a lot of uh, innovative strategies there in the face of uh, some very harsh circumstances, and uh, we hope you'll stick around for the Q&A, Bill. And at this point, let me introduce uh, Harold, and he's the housing coordinator for the city of Riverside, California, so we're heading uh, way southwest from Cleveland, and we'll get you unmuted there, Shonda. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, here we'll get started. Um, the city of Riverside, through its housing authority, um, administered the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. And in our organization, NSP is kind of the acronym for everything that turned into ACK Rehab, Resale, and Rental primarily. Um, you can see we had $35 million dedicated to NSP efforts, neighborhood stabilization efforts, I guess, generally. Um, and you can see the breakout below. Um, NSP1, NSP3, I'm sure you're all familiar with. The TOO, Targets of Opportunity Program, was funded with redevelopment money before our fabulous governor um, helped himself to those funds. Um, we were able to spend most of that $5 million on this process before he got it. Um, and the LOC line of credit, we um, were able to leverage funds and get a loan from City National Bank for 75 basis points below prime. Um, we, the city had a really good relationship with that bank. So we were able to use $9 million of that line of credit to accomplish our 128 or so dwelling units to date. And you can see one of the big examples we had here on Mill Road Avenue. What the Riverside chose to focus on was uh, ACK Rehab Bail primarily of single-family homes and rental um, properties as well. The rental properties were mainly to serve households or below 50% AMI. Um, looking at the household income of 50% AMI and knowing our demographics of our city, these are typically households that don't have the income to pay 
for the associated upkeep of a house. Um, if something breaks on the road, yard maintenance, uh, increased electrical and, gosh knows, cooling bills in the summer in Riverside. Um, so that's why our strategy was split there. We also did ACT demo for houses that were just absolutely beyond repair. Um, we have some great photos of those, too. Um, two things we found were absolutely key to moving quickly was our city council and our city manager delegated signature authority to our de department director primarily and also empowered staff to sign a lot of the routine, non-controversial documents um, that didn't change deal points so that if there were disclosures involved in the real estate process, instead of waiting a two or three to get higher ups to sign off on something that's kind of consequential in the scheme of things, staff was able to do that and keep the process going. Um, also, all properties were held in the name of the housing authority, so we're the ones that actually hold title to it. I think that um, helped the neighborhood st stabilize, maybe in a, some small way, um, when people saw that the, the housing authority was involved and that houses were being rehabbed, at least from a title perspective, they saw that the city was involved and investing in, in these homes. The ocean, how we did it, uh, acquisition demo, disposition was primarily through, acquisition was through NCST, the trust, primarily. We did work with local real estate agents as well in the beginning, but making those inroads, as you know, was quite difficult. Um, we just NCST to be the best source of property. To go to Jose's question earlier, um, we have to turn off our pipeline to NCST because right now we've got our hands full rehabbing what we have as far as the multifamilies, so we're not actively working with the trust, so I can't really speak to whether um, in yeah, the numbers have gone down or not. Um, Contract administration and oversight of the disposition to the qualified buyer. Again, a lot of that responsibility was delegated to staff. We didn't have to go through and have city council action for every buyer and every disposition process. So that's essentially one staff uh, position. Actually, at our height, we had five staff people, but we're back down to just one. Rehab, um, that was another set of professionals. Um, we qualified panels of contractors, we drafted scopes of work, did job walks with the contractors, and just did over overall construction management. The pre-qualification of the local contractors was absolutely key, and I know there's another slide in here to cover that right here. Um, ACT Rehab Resale is another example. Um, accessing properties, as I mentioned a minute ago, was kind of a challenge, so we also worked with our city attorney's office via code enforcement. This house, obviously the before picture on the left, was a parolee flop house of such. Um, it was horrible. You'd walk in knee deep in clothes and various discarded items um, that we'd turn around. This street was a problem, had a long-standing crime problem, and this was something that we were able to help around. We also got the house across the street from this, um, and it looked pretty much the same. Those two located mid-block really made a difference in the neighborhood. So clustering where we were able to was great, but um, in our market it was far between where we had those opportunities. And qualified contractors, as I mentioned before, what we did was we created a pre-approved list of contractors. So we did an open RFP, posted it on our city's website, um, followed all the formal bidding procedures, once we were able to um, pre-qualify con contractors that met our outlined requirements, insurance requirements, all that stuff, um, we dealt, we went down, I think, to eight contractors in our first year. Once we had scopes of work drafted, we would email and send bids out to just those eight contractors. A contractor was pre-qualified for a one-year period. Um, if their work was satisfactory, we had the option to extend their contract for another year. If they did unsatisfactory work um, or were difficult to work with or any other number of problems, lots of overruns and cost, as their bidding wasn't on par, um, we could 
ax them at any time. So we found that to be a really great, great tool and really help streamline the process. Um, challenges that we had, we have an advanced age of housing stock here in Riverside um, and unforeseen construction issues that aren't obvious when you first walk through the property. We did see, we see some elevated construction costs. Um, we are also bound by historic districts. Um, the house on this slide, I think, probably ended up costing us around 250000 to rehab. Um, it would have been much nicer and probably more financially prudent to demo it, but unfortunately it's in a national registered district, so that really wasn't going to happen. Um, so what we decided to do and we, what we found that we could do was add a list of owner options in the bid amount. Um, and have everyone add that dollar amount to their bid. Um, by specifically calling it out as an owner's option, we were under no obligation to incur those costs, but we had that extra cushion of money there and the ability to do no countertops if we saw some wiring that was an unforeseen issue, for example. Um, so able to enlist the help of our building and safety safety department and our building official to use alternate methods and means, especially in our older houses where nothing is really standard. Our building official was um, really being able to help us identify workers that, that were safe and cost effective and would work in our particular house. The other thing we do is scattered site rental. Um, uh, dupes, triplex, and fourplexes. We do have a couple of larger apartment units, 116 unit, 128 unit. We found the duplex, triplex, and fourplex were a great size because you didn't have to have on some management. They were still located in single family residential neighborhoods, so you were still getting that impact and providing um, space for households of lower income to. Lit. Property management, we have two Chotos um, and one for-profit. Our one for-profit does one of our big uh, properties, and when we purchased that property, we assumed the management contract in place so that we wouldn't upset the residents. We found that they were doing a great job maintaining it, so we kept them on board for the time being. Uh, site rental why we choose to do it. It's difficult in California to obtain large blocks of available properties and again to serve households at or below 50% AMI. Demo, as I said, there were some houses that were just too far gone. Um, so that's what we did. We knocked them down. We are in the process of awarding these vacant lots to nonprofits. We have found uh, three that will begin construction in early 2013 with the only subsidy being down to the land. The nonprofits are willing to build the house and sell it. Um, so we thought that was pretty cool. For success, like I said, council and city, city management was extremely flexible um, and allowed staff to be empowered to run with it. Evolving scope of work. I think we're on vision 12 or version 12 or 13 of our scope of work. We're constantly making changes um, that benefit the project, and that as we do more and more, so we incorporate it into our scope of work. Uh, and again, pre-approved panel of contractors has really helped with the bidding process. Um, and as the contractors get familiar with how we work, the visions of the program and they're a lot easier to work with. And that was it. Shonda, just, you said the Housing Authority, it owns, it's going to own all of the scattered site rental units as well? Yes. And so are you able to use Housing Authority staff for the maintenance and the property management? One of the CHOTOs do property management on them, um, depending on the maintenance item in question. You pay for it, or the Chodo may. The Chodo it gets reimbursed on. They get a management fee um, and a permit fee as well. 
And so how many units does a children are they able to get some kinds of scale to kind of make this more economically viable, or are you still working on that? Um, well, the children end up owning any of them. Or management. The yeah, they have, let me think. Let me go back a couple of slides. Um, I, get yeah, it. Where, which slide would you like? Mm, keep going. So there we go. There um, okay. So one Shoto takes care of 17 units, one Shoto takes care of 16, and then the for-profit takes care of the 28. Got it. Okay. All right. Can I have any other uh, uh, questions no, or no for questions anybody? No questions queued up okay. at the moment, but let me uh, just remind people how they can ask questions. Of course, you can click your hand button under your name in the participant list, or you can submit them in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. And uh, so happy to take questions for um, for any of our, our panelists, Honda, uh, Bill Whitney, uh, Mike Pleasure, Joan Oliva, B. Schott, of course, uh, David and Hunter are standing by as well. Hey, Ken. Yeah. Um, maybe we could go back to one of the questions that was asked earlier about um, uh, how we're going to deal with target areas um, post closeout. I did put that one on hold. We did. Yeah, sure. Um, do you remember exactly what it was? It was from Jose. Or Jose, if you're there, you could click your RAN button now. There we go. Hi, Jose. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted to know um, after closeout, we have NSP. Um, this intent happens to the target areas. Do we have to buy those target areas, or is there any flexibility regarding um, the market changes? How are we going to be able to continue to um, spend our money in target areas? Right. So, so, so there, there were a number of um, technical changes that um, were discussed in the closeout notice. Okay. Um, but for the most part, what you'll see as you read through it is that the NP rules that are currently in place will uh, continue to be in place post uh, closeout, right? Unless the, the says otherwise. And, and there's a bunch of specific things in here that speaks to land banking, um, it speaks to uh, RAM income, it speaks to demolition. A, a variety of things like that. So um, it, it, it speaks to reporting. As it applies to uh, the target areas, um, since that the, that is a, a requirement that comes from the statute, right, um, that, that you work in areas of greatest need, moving on beyond the closeout period, um, You'll continue to be expected to work in what we're calling um, target areas, areas of greatest need. But you can amend that if, if need be, right? You can. So, so obviously, as the market is changing, um, there, there's there's a need for you to adapt to those changes and 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 um, um, alter your program as needed, right? Um, so you, so you can continue to uh, uh, amend your target areas. Um, you'll always be expected to have um, um, proved areas in your um, act plan. Okay. Thanks. And uh, still plenty of time to take up other questions for any of your peers. A lot of variety in the uh, strategies we were hearing today. Lots of vision going on. Any good jokes? <laughs> this is Peggy. Um, I see a written question here for me. 
Um, oh, it went straight to sure. Go ahead. Yeah, and it, it's from Agnes Chambers. And for the home ownership program, are you looking at at the credit scores of the homeowners of the buyers? And we are ratio driven. We really don't look at credit scores at all. Uh, we look at those things I mentioned. We look at foreclosures and um, drafts, and we look at ratios to make sure that they can afford the house. But we do not at all look at credit scores. Thanks for the question. Uh, Gary has a question for John. Uh, he's wondering how large is the target area in Lake Worth and uh, really likes your marketing campaign. Our target area is actually um, probably about two square miles. And just a stand, how many uh, marketing majors did you have on your staff when you started this? I don't have any. <laughs> like I said, there was only three of us here when we first got the grant, so uh, we've expanded to five. But um, but you know, we've always done all of our own marketing. Everything starts in the office and, and gets approved here. We've hired an outside consultant or anything. And what inspires you to do something so colorful? And so, uh, I think so the, out community, there. the community out there. <laughs> I, see, we don't see it as out there. So I think I think it's really just the environment that we're in here in Lake Worth. Um, it's kind of a little different city. It's kind of um, over to is funky and kind of off the beaten track. And I, I guess maybe working here for four years, I've become a funky and off the beaten track as well. So um, all these things uh, that that we do, you know, just appear. Um, you know, rare, I suppose and we have such a diverse community as well. We have a lot of um, Haitian, Guatemalan people here. We also have the Center for um, Gay and, and Lesbian and Transgender um, people here as well. So, you know, we knew we had to appeal to a lot of the different people, um, and so that was kind of part of our, our thought process in moving forward. We've got a question from uh, Sharon who asks. Uh, and this could be for, for anybody, any of our uh, peers. Uh, any success in finding properties outside the target area when there aren't any inside the targeted area? I've found some outside the target area, but they were still within the same census tracts that we used to um, get the grant. Since our area itself actually so incredibly small, um, after talking to the HUD office, we were able to go a little bit outside of our target area and incorporate those onto our program. Else on the panel? Maybe that's helpful, Sharon. Any, uh, I wonder if any of the uh, the panelists have questions for each other. That's a lot to just uh, put the feed out there. And while, while folks are, are thinking if there's any more questions, let me just let you know about a couple things. Just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it will be placed, the recording will be placed along with the PF version of the slides on the and a resource exchange website, and that usually happens rather quickly, um, within a day or two, typically, and then uh, a written transcript uh, gets added to that as well. And a uh, number of upcoming NSP webinars, still uh, one more this year, next Tuesday, the uh, Decision Demo and Closeout webinar, and followed by those three that you see there in January. And uh, pretty soon, I imagine more will get added to the, the schedule. And you can and have a, yeah. I, I had a question for, for the panelists. Um, if we're if they're waiting for others to, to ask. Sure. I, um, I was over at NeighborWorks this morning, and um, you know, a number of um, the grantees who were there participating in their um, NeighborWorks Institute here in uh, Washington, D.C. We're talking about the momentum that's been built up through the 
ESP around um, affordable housing redevelopment. And I think um, the, the, the speaker from, um, from Riverside even touched on it, the fact that NSP has become much more than, you know, the HUD-defined program. It's, it's the way they do um, everything from acquisition, rehab to resale, and even r rental housing. And I'm, I'm curious <coughs> to, to know how or at least what some of the ideas are on the table for how um, you guys will continue to, um, on the success that you've had with NSP, um, once the once this this this, this program um, closes out. And if you can jump in on that. Um, this, this is Bill. I mean, we'll be doing a lot of the, the same stuff, only certainly um, available money for rehab, whether it be single family or multifamily. Um, block rent is shrinking quite a bit. Um, you know, there's home money, but uh, things uh, are a little sparse out there. And Cleveland and in Cuyahoga County, we've always had real tight, good relationships among nonprofits and government. So again, we'll continue to work with NHS and a lot of other partners. Uh, but the lack of resources is going to be a problem. You, you were uh, well, I wanted to respond to that. Something that William said earlier, <clears throat> talking about buying up a lot of houses early. Our, our houses have kind of disappeared in Florida. There are big corporations buying up, up um, a, lot of the re, the, a lot of the foreclosed properties, so we don't even get near them anymore. And to answer the second question is I think we're going to be doing some more um, new, new construction. Yeah, this is Bill. I'm Florida and a number of the other areas where you see statistics about foreclosures and the crisis was just very much different than in uh, Cuyahoga County. I mean, there's overbuilding, or, and this is a, they be inaccurate, but it's, or it's an oversimplification, but it's, uh, you know, the overbuilding or whatever, and stuff may sell for a while at 50 cents for a dollar, but here in Cuyahoga County, the many of the so-called foreclosed assets are really just liabilities that have to be knocked down. And unfortunately, any for-profit people who have had large purchasers are really flippers, many of whom break the law. There was just a guy arrested in Florida the other day that we dragged back to Cuyahoga. <laughs> At a very nice house in Naples. <laughs> so it is. Uh, you're right, Peggy. It's, it's just very different. Parts of Florida that have uh, the parts of Florida with had that have the kind of traditional Florida amenities are the ones that are rebounding the fastest. And then, you know, people forget Florida is a very big state, and there's a lot of parts of it that experience the boom and the bust, but there was never any real reason for a boom to be there. And so I think those are the parts that are going to be kind of much slower to to recover. And uh, John, I was just going to respond to uh, David's question. For organizations such as ourselves, um, you know, being really small and doing nothing but redevelopment, um, this has really given us a lot of momentum to move forward with other economic development uh, opportunities. We're not an entitlement. Um, we don't receive any home CDBG, any of that. And the city does, uh, but for us. It gave us a foothold into, you know, the community and as far as we made a name for ourselves as being, you know, good to work with and being able to get projects done in a relatively short amount of time. And also with the 20 partners that we had, it, it really gave us an opportunity to say to people, um, especially in the South Florida area, you know, Lake Worth is here. We're open for business. Um, we work well. <laughs> we can work well with others. Um, and there's really a lot of different things that we're now doing because of the HUD grant with different partners. We're applying for different grants. We're looking at different programs. We can introduce to other organizations who have, you know, some help for some of the other needs that we have. 
whether it's related to you know, transportation or you know cultural enhancement or things like that. So the, the event has really given us a a huge step up to kind of play with um, you know some of the big boys as opposed to kind of always being separate in this kind of very small town um, that has really been devastated by foreclosures and abandonment over the last few years. It's like the, a lasting legacy. That's a, a good thing. Mm, I hope so. Hmm. Is uh, um, Dan and uh, uh, and Hunter a chance for any last words in a second? But um, first, let me remind you uh, that when you do the webinar today, you'll be automatically redirected to a SurveyMonkey website, and we appreciate any feedback you have for that. It just takes a minute or two. Uh, written comments are especially helpful there, and. Uh, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, the NFT peers that were here today, Peggy Schott, Joan Oliva, Mike Plazier, Bill Whitney, and Shonda Harold. Uh, thanks to all of you. And who uh, didn't hear from Serbi today, but Serbi was uh, working closely with Stan and uh, pulling together today's uh, cast of peers. So thanks to both Stan and Serbi for that, and of course, David and Hunter for being here as well. So uh, any words okay I, I just wanted to, um, to to say thank you as well you know oftentimes uh, we here at HUD spend a lot of our time working with those grantees that are are really struggling and um, I think it's refreshing to hear some of the um, stories that you guys shared with us today about the success that you've had with the program and um, it, it, it gives us um, so, some some hope that um, you know your examples can be replicated in other places in other markets, and um, I, ju I just um, hope that um, others who are listening out there, you know, may um, reach out with you and um, and collaborate um, to the extent that it make it makes sense. So that um, we could continue to build on your success and replicate it in other places. So um, thank you, Stan, um, for, 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 for moderating this. Thank you, uh, Serbi, for, for, for researching the uh, grantees that we, we wanted to profile on this webinar. And um, thanks, Hunter, for, uh, for coming up with the idea. And uh, thank you all of you for being here, and uh, we appreciate your your being here and look forward to seeing you soon on another NSP webinar. Take care everyone. Very good.